the gospel according to Matthew chapter 10, and we'll begin reading with verse 1. All of our guests and friends, we welcome you again. Thank you so much for sharing your time and life with us today. We really, really appreciate it. And when Jesus had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. These 12, verse 5, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who is in it worthy, and there abide till you go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. If the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verse 5, these twelve Jesus sent for, and commanded them, saying, Father, in the great name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. We thank you for your resurrection. We thank you for the gifts of God that are in operation in the house today. We thank you for your tremendous people who you've saved, sanctified, and one day will resurrect from this old world. We give you praise this morning that you would anoint the words that I'm about to speak to the hearts of those who are about to receive. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. When you think about Jesus Christ and you read the Gospels, you think about Jesus the Savior, Jesus the Healer, Jesus the miracle worker, and Jesus, the mighty God in Christ, and Jesus, the outpour of the Spirit of God, and Jesus, the great orator, the great teacher, the great speaker, the great prophet. When you think about Jesus in the New Testament, you think about him in a myriad of lights because many roles he assumed. He was the preacher to the center. He was the confidant to the publican. He was the helper to the hurting. He was the lifter of those who were, who, who, who were, who were lame. He, he was just absolutely everything to every one. Jesus Christ was the consummate Savior, the greatest King. He was absolutely fascinating and phenomenal. And you could just place any adjective at the end of Jesus and it would be adequate because he is absolutely indescribable, incomparable. He absolutely is intrinsic in every way. When you think about his birth, you think about his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his outpourings. I mean, he's everything, isn't he? Jesus Christ, you can just use every term, every, every synonym, every antonym, everything you want, and you just never come to the end of it. Because he is fabulous. No wonder the writers called him the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, the root and the offspring of David, uh, the bride and the morning star. No, no wonder they couldn't ever really compress him into one particular syllable. So they called him he that wi which was and is and is to come. They called him the almighty. They called him the high priest. They called him the potentate. They just couldn't get their hands around the greatness of Jesus Christ. And so in the gospel you see him working and walking and willing his will to throughout the, the land of Judea. You see him in Capernaum. You see him in Jerusalem. You see him in Nazareth. You see him speaking from ships and boats and mountain tops and valleys. You see him in the synagogue and in the temple. Everywhere you see him, he's working. He's doing incredible feats. He's doing extraordinary things and people are coming by the multitudes to hear 
hear his words, to touch his garments, to feel his presence, to have the impartation of his grace because Jesus Christ was and is the most fascinating phenomenal thing that the world has ever known. There is none like him and there is none coming after him. He is alone and there's no one else that will ever be like our Jesus. Would you say amen? And so when you look at Jesus Christ and his incredible ministry, the scope and the span of it, uh, you realize that he was all things to all people, that by all means he might save some, as Paul declared in 1 Corinthians. Uh, and yet when you come to chapter 10, uh, you really begin to see the greatest view of Christ. Uh, you see the most illuminating aspects uh, of his reign and kingdom. When you think about his miracles, they were minty. When you think about his ministry, it was powerful. When you think about the things that he did, they were extraordinary. But it was not those things that really gained the center page of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was this one ideal that surrounded his life. It was this one heartbeat that beat deep within the reservoir of who he was. It was this one theme that was threaded throughout the Gospels that hung on the cross of Calvary, that rose from the grave, that ascended from the Mount of Olives and trumpeted that one day, not too soon, he would return again and he would come to redeem those who had become the first fruits of those that were dead. But in the 10th chapter of the book of Matthew, you see for the very first time in the most clairvoyant of ways that this is the totality of who he really is. Jesus Christ is none other than the greatest recruiter in the world. And it is his recruitment of these 12 and their recruitment of the others that makes the keystone, chief stone and cornerstone of what Jesus Christ came to do. He came to make us believe in him so much that we would go forth into the world and become a recruiter for the greatest army the world has ever known. That we would become his arms and hands, his lips and mouth, his tongue, his eyes, that we would become his feet in this world, would you say amen? He wanted the world to know that what I'm growing is not a church of people, but a group of recruiters, would you say amen? It is amazing that America has been able through the centuries to recruit a standing army by simply having men all across the, the nation with their particular armed force uh, saying come and be a part of the future protection of our great land. And I, I just began to realize that what Jesus Christ is all about is truly making recruiters out of his recruits. I thought it was fascinating. I, many of you don't like football, so I hate to use football analogies. Uh, because, But I look at the college athletics across our land, and I realize that the Texas Longhorns, and if you're a Longhorn fan, God bless you. If you're an Aggie fan, God help you. But I looked, and do you know that they have 18 freshmen? that are starting this year. They got 18 brand new newbies who they're depending on to help them. Boy, when's the last church you've been in where newbies got to do anything but carry out the trash? Where the newbies got to do anything but, uh, you, 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 know, you know, serve in the most arcane of ways? Is that not what's wrong with the church? We got a bunch of old people doing everything and yet we're not recruiting the new folks. No wonder Jesus Christ, his most anthem, his greatest clarion call, his most succinct direction was you got to keep recruiting the new people because the church is not about those old folks like me, but it's about the new blood. Do you understand that every major denomination in the world today is having great struggle in recruiting new folks except for two, the Jehovah Witness and the Mormons? Because you see, they recognize the value of recruiting. And every day they're recruiting. 
If you go to the Jehovah Witness Church, it is your duty to spend 30 hours a week recruiting. If you're a part of the Mormon Church, you spend two years of your life. You may forego college. You forego a girlfriend. You forego going home for moms and dads at Christmases. You live on $65 a week. You, you witness seven to eight hours a day. You're in the recruitment business. But when you get into the Latter-day Church, you get into this famous church that all of us have come out of, whether it's the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Church of God, Catholic, or whatever. We just come in and we, we get recruited in and then we get a position and we're like, nobody's going to take my place. And so we become basically annihilators and we become no progenitorators and we become widows and orphans in the house of God. But how many of you, if you've got a business, know you better go recruit some new business partners. You better go recruit some new clients or your business will fold. You, you do understand that God didn't save you to take you to heaven. He saved you to become a part of his living, breathing army. I have found out that it is statistically true that 95% of people never win anyone to God. And so basically 95% of those who are sitting in pews have no real understanding of why they were saved. They think they were saved for a mansion in heaven and a crown and a white robe and palms. But I just want you to know, no, you were not saved for the future. You were saved for the present, for right now. This is the reason God called you. He could have saved you and killed you, but he saved you and kept you because this is the greatest moment in your life. This is the greatest hour of your life. It is the day that you can become what Christ has always wanted you to be and that is a sender forth so that you can become a recruiter for the kingdom of almighty God. We say man it is amazing that every other organization in the world their number one deal is recruitment because they understand that it doesn't matter how good you are the older you get, the worth, more worthless you become. Now, I know that hurts. But we all have to admit, the older you get, you quit running as fast. You quit dreaming as big. You quit waking up and saying, hey, let's see what else I can do. You start thinking about fishing boats and golf courses and lawn, lawn chairs, beaches, clubhouses, sororities now I know somebody is shaking your head I'm just asking you the question we'll be looking here in the next few weeks to see recruiting you would think if you've got the best thing since apple pie you'd want to share it when the Athens Hornets were playing really good football last year it's amazing I've been to football games when they were sorry nobody came but it's amazing they started winning and guess what happened grandma started showing up Uncle Bob that doesn't even know anything about football started showing up. I mean, all of the sudden, people that hadn't been in the game in a decade started showing up. Why? Because all of the sudden, winning caused recruitment to begin to take place. And how many of you know the greatest gift God has ever given you is the ability to recruit somebody else for Jesus Christ? Amen. The reason your car has back seats and front seats, front seats for you and the back seats for others. How many are thankful today God is in the recruiting business? But you see, it's very difficult when you, when you come into the kingdom of God and you get satisfied and solidified. And... See, if you didn't become a recruiter, it's hard to become a recruiter. But see, Jesus Christ, this is what's fascinating about him. He's the most amazing man. He recruited 12 guys. He hand-selected them from a city. And he got all 12 of them to buy in to the greatest plan. And the Bible said he sent them forth and he said, listen, you don't need any money. You don't need any brass in your purses. You don't need any script. You don't have to have any written works. You don't even need coats but one. You don't even need shoes. And you don't need anything to defend yourself with. You just need to go, and I promise you that if you go and you'll recruit like I recruit, you'll find plenty of places to stay, you'll find plenty of food to eat, you'll find plenty of money to use. Matter of fact, if you'll do it the way I've done it, 
you'll have the greatest of success. Isn't that amazing? Our problem is when we start evangelizing, we try to do it with all of the contrapments of whatever we've heard all of our life. And Jesus Christ, when he got ready to evangelize the world, he just came as a naked baby. Grew up in isolation. And when he started his ministry, he had zero. He didn't have anybody. He had one old guy that believed in him called John the Baptist. He was baptized. The Spirit of God fell on him. And the first thing he did is he found a couple old fishermen and he convinced them that he had a better job for them. Now, you've got to be pretty good to convince a guy to give up his living to follow you. You think about, you talk about cultic. You think about Jim Jonesy. Jesus Christ walked up to those guys and he said, hey guys, tell you what, would you be willing to get rid of all this? Would you be willing to get rid of everything you've got and just follow me? And I'll make you fishers of men. Boy, you must have had a pretty good recruitment speech. It's pretty good. I, I mean, is there anybody here that I convinced today just give up everything you've got? And starting tomorrow, you just walk out on nothing. Well, some of your wives wouldn't let you. See, that's why the devil found them outside. See, he caught them when their wives weren't around. You notice that? <laughs> he caught Peter and John. <laughs> he caught Peter and John. You know, there wasn't no women around to keep them kind of balanced and modified. You know, you, you get a man away from his spouse, he'll be radical. You get him around him, he'll be like, "Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah." Have you ever seen men, they talk big when mama's not around, don't they? You get mama around, they just become old putty cats. That's the truth, Garvin. I've seen you. But Jesus Christ was the greatest recruiter in the world. Now you think about this. Why would Jesus Christ use the arcane tools of the trade when he could have simply recruited in a lot of ways? See, when you go to Matthew chapter 4, the Bible says... Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the sons of Zebzedee, and John his brother in a ship with Zebzedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Now that, my friend, I'd be like dad's got two of his sons employed. I mean, you know, he, he done got to the place where he's delegating, which is a form of dumping, and he's got his two boys out there doing all the labor he used to do. And I'm sure he's saying things like, yeah, boys, when I was your age, I could do twice as much, y'all. But Jesus walks right up to a father and his two sons, and he says, hey, guys, I know your father's a great man. I know you love him a lot, but hey, won't you change occupations today? Was Jesus worried about Zebzedee's future living? No, he's in the recruitment business. I wished I could get some of my elders to start wearing a bow tie. Man, if they got to look at that good, they'd become recruiters. But he convinced two young men to leave their occupation, to leave their living, to leave what they were doing and just start following him to become preachers of the gospel. So here's Jesus Christ on his first day of ministry. And he's already in the recruiting business. He's already in the business of getting people to follow him. And it doesn't look like he had a big spill. It doesn't look like he said you'll be made millionaires overnight. It didn't look like he said if you'll sow a thousand, you'll get 10,000 in return. It didn't look like he said, man, if you'll follow me, you'll get to sit on my right and left hand in heaven. No, he just simply said, hey, guys, do you want a chance at being something you've never been? Do you want a chance of having something you've never had? Do you want a chance of becoming something you will never be? 
He simply gave them an opportunity to believe that there was something he had that they couldn't find in fishing. They couldn't find in career. They couldn't find in the occupation. They couldn't find in the world. That's why when Mac Brown sends his recruiters around the state of Texas, he is trying to recruit every young man and saying, hey, if you'll come to Texas, it'll be better than Oklahoma. It'll be better than Texas A&M. It'll be better than Florida or USC. If you'll come to Texas, I'm telling you, we'll turn you into something and someone you've never thought possible. It is in the recruitment of the church that there is life and vitality and vibrancy. It is in that moment that the church becomes the church of the living God. Would you say amen? So no wonder the greatest tool the Lord ever used was the simple recruitment of others by his people. You think about it in the church. Think about your personal life for a moment. How many people since you came to the Lord, whether it was a month ago, a year ago, a decade ago, half a century ago, have you personally recruited into the Lord's army? You can, you can write on the wall that when you started recruiting them, you had to take them out of the fires of hell. You had to take them out of the dungeons of sin. You had to get them released from the captor. You had, you had to make sure that they realized that what they were involved in could not compete nor compare with what you were trying to get them involved in. You had to be willing to bring them into your life. You had to be willing to let them hang around with you for a while. You know, when I think about Jesus, one of the great extraordinary qualities that he had is that he was willing to allow 12 guys to hang around him for three and a half years. Almost every day. Man, you, you, you know, how, how many likes people for a little while? Like, you like them in small doses. <laughs> The master who we're supposed to example. I mean, he's supposed to be the guy we were looking for. We're not supposed to look for the church elders. We're not supposed to look at the church preachers. We're not looking at the hierarchy of so-called religious order. But Jesus Christ is supposed to be the model and the mentor of who we're supposed to be. And he allowed these guys to be around him for three and a half years, almost every day. Now, I don't know about you. Benjamin Franklin probably had it right for most of us. You know, visitors and fish, you know, they both began to stink about three days, after three days. And so we don't like people around us. That's why we're not recruiters. See, great recruiters have this wonderful benevolence that says, you know what, I'm in the business of training, recruiting, discipling, and helping other people. And that means if I'm going to do anything for them, I've got to be around them. I've got to let them be around me so that through osmosis and through teaching they can begin to derive from me the benefits that I have for them. Jesus Christ sent these untrained, he sent these nobodies, he sent these novices of the church that he was building two by two out into the world and he said you just go out there to all the cities in Israel you don't take anything with you and you just go tell them about the kingdom of God and while you go you heal, you set free, you deliver, you make whole you just go do good to everybody you meet and you'll find some that will receive you and some that will reject you but you don't worry about it you're in the recruiting business No wonder we don't talk about recruiting. That's why the churches, you know, we, we, we've got into every other method of recruitment. But Jesus Christ, I mean, he, he didn't have no band. He didn't have any buildings. He didn't have any flashy advertisements. He didn't have any slick political sound bites. He didn't have a national news media to excerpt. No, he just simply had the greatest model in the world, and that is, if you believe in it, you can get somebody else to believe in it. 
Doesn't matter if you're educated or uneducated. Doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Doesn't matter if you're black or white. Doesn't matter if you've been in the church a day or 16 years. Matter of fact, the statistics prove that almost all people are won by someone who's been in the church less than six months. Because you see, recruiting is really what Jesus Christ came to about. He said, pray therefore that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into the harvest. He said, we've got a shortage of laborers, and you've got to pray that I'm going to send them out there. And you see, the only people who can be sent are those who have been first called. Well, how many of you have you been called? How many of you have been called by the Lord? See, you already make the first requirement. If you've been called, now you can be sent. Think about it. What would happen today if we recognize that the greatest calling in the Lord is not, not all of the things that you now possess, but the one thing that we do need to possess, and that is an overwhelming zeal to make sure that our, our body of believers, which is Christ's church in the world, begins to grow and thrive. The Bible said, and when he had called unto him his twelve. I, I mean, that's what I love about it. You know, in the church, what we do is we got like 100 people. We call like 30. You know, we hand pick them. Because we, we don't want to deal with rejection. <laughs> he just calls all 12. It's kind of like if you're in me, you're in my church, <laughs> everybody gets a work ticket. Everybody gets a job description. And he didn't even ask them, hey, would you like to be the choir director? Would you like to be the Sunday school teacher? Would you like to clean out the cupboards? Would you like to cook them? He, he said, hey, guys, before we get into building all of the framework that creates bad church, let's deal with what creates great church. And he said, let's, uh, let's understand why we're here. It's to make disciples. How many of you folks have a few kids in your life? Now, you're going to act like that's not what you got married for, but that's the only reason God ever wanted you to get married for, to produce something that would emanate from you so that your lintage could survive. Why do you think the Old Testament spent so much time making sure that the lineage was intact? What do you think in Matthew and also in Luke, the Lord spent the first couple of chapters of those books describing the lineage because it's very important that there is a continuation of what's began. And so guess what? He called all 12. Everybody say 12. And I'm, I'm not going to be long today because we have food over there in football. Um, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, everybody say he gave. That's amazing. See, this is where Jesus Christ is just uncanny. He's got these 12 basically newbies. They've just been around a few weeks. I mean, they've heard the Sermon on the Mount. They've seen a few things he's done. And Brother Stafford, not only is he about to send them out, but he's going to give them the very stuff he uses to do his recruitment. He's not going to just send them out and say, do the best you can with what you've got. I hope it works out well. No, Brother Stan, it's like a man coming to work for you, and on the first day of the job, you walk into the tool shed and you say, everything here you can use. Anytime, it's yours. You walk into the office and say, here's the checkbook. Any checks you need to write, you just start writing them. You walk into the, you say, whatever's here, you just take advantage of it because I want you to be successful. The Bible said Jesus Christ, he called them, he is getting ready to commission them, and he gave them power. Everybody say power. No wonder the people of God do not recruit. We don't give them the power to become great recruiters. Because we don't think they're qualified. See, we always want to qualify. That's why institutionalism and organization is worthless. Because they always want to qualify everyone. Do you understand that Jesus Christ would have never met the criteria for any national organization that's alive today? He couldn't have got a fellowship card or a ministerial license with any of them. Because he hadn't been to their college. He hadn't preached for six months under somebody. He didn't get the right hand of fellowship in the right congregation. No, Jesus Christ would not be able to preach in most of the pulpits in the world 
Because you see, he wanted us to know that if you're going to recruit people, you've got to give them everything that you've got. Jesus Christ said he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. He sent them out with the same capacity to work as he had. What would happen? In, what would happen? If you realize that as a child of God, that if you will become a recruiter for Jesus Christ, he will enable you with every tool that is necessary to be successful. These 12, Jesus sent forth, and he commanded them, I want you to go to the lost sheep of the house. He made it very specific, go to lost people. There it is right there. That's the greatest key in the world. Go to lost people. Church is always trying to save folks in their family that are already saved. You ever tried to unsave somebody that was already saved? It don't matter if they're lost or not. If they think they're saved, you're trying to unsave somebody that already thinks they're saved. Do you understand Jesus Christ never messed around with saved people or so-called saved people? When did you ever see him sit down at a Pharisee conference? When was he ever the number one speaker at the Sadducees convention? When did you ever find him in the brotherhood of the Essenes saying, hey guys, let me tell you a few things? No, Brother Leonard, because he realized you can't do nothing with saved people or so-called saved people or church people or religious people or ritualistic people. So what did Jesus do? He turned his ministry to the lost sheep of Israel. He turned his ministry to the lost people of Samaria. He said, if you'll go to the lost, they'll hear you. Do you really understand that, that if you quit trying to save those that don't want to be saved and start trying to save those that don't even know they can be saved, all of a sudden, your ability to be a recruiter go right up. I mean, when Mac Brown is recruiting football players, I promise you he's not getting them off the volleyball team. He's not getting them out of the dance team. He's not getting them out of the science class. He's not getting them out of the bowling club. Where do you think he's going to find his recruits? He's going to the field where young men have made a decision that they want to play football. And where do you think the, the church ought to go find the folks to make the church the next big thing in town? They ought to go to the field where the church is supposed to go. And the Bible said the only field we're ever supposed to plow in is the field where the lost are. Go out into the highways and the byways and compel them. Compel. Everybody say compel. That's like, you know, compelling them. I mean, people respond when you, when you recognize that you've been a recruiter. There's people in this building right now, you, you could become some of the greatest recruiters the kingdom of God has ever, ever known. If you'll just forget everything you've ever heard in church. If you'll forget everything you ever came out of, every catechism you ever learned. And if you'll just go to lost people and tell them about Jesus Christ from your own mouth. You'll be amazed at how God will show up and electrify that moment with his power and his presence. You say, well, you know what? But, you know, we don't just need anybody out there doing, you know, they might hurt the church. No, 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 no. Has anybody ever read the book of Acts? <laughs> Did anybody ever hear of Philip the evangelist in the New Testament gospels? No, you didn't. Didn't hear about it. No, I mean, Philip the Evangelist, he just kind of like, he just showed up one day. Philip the Evangelist, well, that's not the Philip and Thomas. No, that, no, Philip the Evangelist. He wouldn't have put that tag on him if he was the same cat. Philip the Evangelist, he just shows up. How many has ever heard of Ananias, the guy who was the, the guy who recruited Paul? Now, everybody talks about Jesus recruiting him. No, Jesus knocked him down and said, hey, I need you to meet my recruiter. Jesus didn't do anything on the road to Damascus. He didn't baptize him, didn't fill him with the Holy Ghost. He said, go meet my recruiter, Ananias. 
Go to the street called Straight. There's a man named there, Anani. You've never heard of him in Scripture. He's mentioned one time. And yet he was the recruiter of the greatest preacher in the New Testament. It's amazing. When you look at what God does, he takes people and he simply commissions them and he gives them the power and he sends them. And if you'll notice, everywhere they went, there was tremendous followings, except for, guess where they never had any success? Hardly in the New Testament. With saved people. With church people. With the religious people. Anybody live in Athens a long time? Anybody live in this community for a long time? Do you know where the sinners hang out at? Where do sinners go? See, sinners are everywhere around us, aren't they? <laughs> I don't know about sinners in Walmart. I found most of y'all there. Sinners. Matt, there's a lot of sinners in the world. But I'll tell you something about church folks. We have become so starchy and so prestigious that we don't like to be around the groveling folks called sinners. That's why we're always trying to save people out of Baptist churches and Presbyterian. And you know what? You're not going to have no success. Because even when you save them, they still got all those wacky ideas. I mean, you ever tried to change somebody's nature? You can't. So if you go find a sinner, a sinner's not trying to play games. He knows he's lost on his way to a devil's hell. But if you can tell him about a Christ that saves, and then you can show him the power that that Savior has, all of a sudden you've got a recruiter. That's why Jesus Christ, why didn't he go down to the school of the Pharisees or the school of the Sadducees or, or the Essenes or the scribes? Why didn't he go get some upper crust and some, and some, and some uh, valedictorians and some salutatorians? And why didn't he go to the halls of learning uh, and get him a bunch of recruits to help him build the church? No, he went and found 12 men uh, that didn't know anything about him. Uh, he went and found 12 old guys uh, that were fishing and tax collecting. Uh, and he said, guys, uh, I got belief that if you'll follow me, I can make you into fishers of men and he took those men and he treated them like men he said you're not just anybody I'm going to give you the same power I've got I'm going to give you the same authority I possess I'm going to give you the same vehicles that I use I'm going to give you the same methods that I possess and he said you just watch what I do and then you go do it and we're going to have the greatest party in the world we're going to win the world to Jesus Christ It's one of the struggles we're having raising our children is we don't want them to go through what we got through to get what we got, and so we want to make it easy for them. And when you make it easy for anybody, they usually just become a flop. You know, just because you took the stairs, you want your kids to take the escalator. I'm telling you, folks, every once in a while, the stairs are good. Jesus Christ never made anything other than simple. Let me close. He gave them strict instructions. He said, don't go in the way of the Gentiles. He said, leave the Gentiles alone. Boy, that doesn't sound like a loving Savior, does it? Why? Because <laughs> he was astute. The time of the Gentiles was not yet come. He understood that group of people is not ready. He told his disciples, guys, there's a whole group of people. You, you don't, don't even waste your time with them. They're not ready yet. How many of you ever spent all of your breath, all of your energy, and all of your stamina on somebody who was not ready yet? He said, don't spend your time on those who are not ready. And into any city of the Samaritans, don't go. He said, the Samaritans, they're wishy-washy. They're half and half. They're lukewarm. They don't know if they're Jew or Gentile. So he said, first, don't go to those people who are not ready, and then don't go to those people who are semi-ready. But go rather to the 
Somebody say that. Lost. Everybody say lost. And what do you call them? Sheep. Isn't that amazing? The reason we're not great recruiters is we look at people in the world like they're just sorry. We talk about sinners like they the scum of the world, like they just no good. Jesus called them sheep. It's amazing. He said, if you're going to recruit from me, the first thing you got to do is get the right perspective of people. They're sheep. They're sheep. They're sheep. They're sheep. You know what's the most fascinating thing about sheep, Karen? Is they can be led easily. Matter of fact, sheep have to have a leader. Matter of fact, without a leader, sheep will get lost. Without a, without a leader, sheep will die. But he said, sheep, because see, sheep, they get used to a voice and they'll follow that voice. And they'll recognize that voice. And they'll love that voice. He said, folks, the drunkard is sheep. The alcoholic, the promiscuous, the prolific, the immoral, the homosexual, the lesbian, the extortioner, the whoremonger. He said, they're sheep. But they're lost. No wonder the church, we get saved and we get real pretty. We talk about people on the other side of the track. We talk about people, we, we get all of this like, all of a sudden because we got saved, we got a better understanding of humanity. Can I tell you, if you don't have the right perspective of people, you'll never love people. You got to see people as Christ saw. He said, Alonzo, he told his disciples, they're sheep. They're not dogs. They're not wolves. They're not the off of the world. They're not reprobates. They're not rebellious. They are lost sheep. And they're my lost sheep. Do you understand that everybody in the world is the Lord's? They're His children. See, when Jesus looks at the world, He's looking at His own kids gone, long, gone wrong. You know, you look at somebody else's lost kids, you're like, oh, he's just a nutcase. He's just sorry. He deserves it. But if it's your lost child, all of a sudden Johnny doesn't look near as black because that's my Johnny. The Lord, he said, guys, these are my kids. They're lost. He said, they're the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's the house God built. He said, my kids are lost. He said, and when you go preach saying, <laughs> this is so phenomenal, no wonder. Well, no wonder we have so little success at winning others. He said, and when you go and you find them, tell them how sorry they are. Tell them how lost they are. Get you a sign and say, you're on your way to hell, buddy. Then on the street corner and say, you're a murderer. Get you a placard and say, bye-bye, sweetie. Hope you have a nice fire tonight. No, he said, you go to my sheep. And you preach, you herald, you scream it, you shout it, you declare it. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. You go tell them that there's about to be something coming to their life that will make their hell become a heaven. You go tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You go tell them uh, their future is bright. You go tell them it's going to be the best days of their life. You go tell them that things are not as they seem. You go tell them the greatest hope they've ever had is on its way. Go tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We witness like this. Uh, you know if you die today, you're going to hell. And he said, they're sheep, folks. They're sheep. When people made fun of Jesus Christ because he was hanging out with the publicans and the sinners, or he, he, or he was eating with the, you know, the gluttons and the wine bibbers, what did he say? He said, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, the righteous don't need me. <laughs> he said, I didn't come for the righteous. You've got to understand that. Jesus Christ realized 
Sister Lee, that even in his day and time, there were a whole group of people that didn't need him. I didn't come for the righteous. I came for those who needed a physician. Man, physician. Who needs a physician? Those who are hurting. Those who are broken. Those who are battered. Those who are bruised. Jesus said, I'm a physician. I've come. He said, the kingdom of heaven is in He said, go tell them. I mean, when, when Mac Brown sends his recruiters out there, he's sitting in some recruits' home. He doesn't tell them, man, the two-a-days are whew, they're horrible. And I'll just be honest, we don't have any, you know, we, down, down in Texas now, we don't have any uh, rich guys going to be sliding you some $100 bills under the table. And now down in Texas, we don't have no car lot owners going to be giving you a new ride. And down in Texas, you know, you're going to have to eat in the cafeteria. And that food's horrible. And down in Texas, I just want you to know, <laughs> nobody's going to be taking your test for you. No, he says down at Texas, it's like the kingdom of heaven on earth. You come to Texas. You come to Texas. Because Texas is the best place for you. Well, we got people out there recruiting for the church saying, man, come on. But whew, music's horrible. Preaching's horrible. People's horrible. It's cliquish. It's cultic. They expect too much. Expect too little. Expect... When's the last time you just said, you know what, I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> you need to come on down to Faith Church. It's the best place in the entire world. Uh-huh, that's exactly right. It's a glory. I got some of my best folks. If you're not convinced this is the best place in the world, who are you going to recruit? Becky, I was looking around. You got about 20 people here today. Thank God you showed up. I looked around this morning. You got about 8 or 10 people here. I said, thank God you showed up. You just had a bunch of kids, so hallelujah for you. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. All the time, Jesus Christ, he told his disciples, you go out there, and he said, when you get through, tell them how great the kingdom is that they're about to, he said, heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely have received, freely give. He said in when you're out there recruiting, make sure you leave something when you leave. Make sure you do something kind before you go. Make sure they realize this kingdom is different than the rest of the kingdoms. You know, when you go over to visit Molly because you're about to talk to her about Jesus, that pecan pie is her favorite. She likes those daily donuts. No, we just go out there with the gospel. Man, I got a Bible. I'm going to hit you over the head with it. Bless God. Hallelujah. I have people come to the office all the time trying to sell something. Guess what they always do? They leave a gift behind. Because they want you to remember they've been by your office. They want you to remember that, hey, they came by. Well, What's the greatest gift? He said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Everybody say, pray for them. I've never met a sinner that didn't have needs. I've never met a lost sheep that didn't have hurts. Leave something behind. And then I close as you stand. He said, freely you have received, freely give. Tom said it this morning in class about righteousness. You know who the greatest recruiters in the kingdom of God have always been and always will be? Those who realize that they didn't earn this. those that understand he did it for me 
freely you have received, freely give.